I invite you to find Daniel chapter 8 in your Bibles again this evening. Lord willing, we, were, we will conclude our study of the ram and goat vision detailed there in Daniel chapter 8. Daniel 8 culminates in the terrible rule of Antiochus Epiphanes, whose reign marked the darkest days of Israel's history to that point. He is the little horn of Daniel 8, verse 9 and following, explained in the interpretation of the vision in verses 23 to 26. His reign is the focal point of Daniel chapter 8. After the return from Babylonian exile, the nation of Israel would be subservient to a sequence of Gentile nations under varying degrees of religious and political freedom and then oppression. But under Antiochus Epiphanes, Yahweh's people would endure unspeakable subjugation and persecution. It would be punishable by death to worship the Lord. This is what we worked our way up to last week. We had something of a lengthy introduction, I hope, to set the stage for us to understand the reason why God would give to Daniel and thereby give to Israel a detailed vision of historical events that would take place some 400 years after Daniel's time, and yet would not culminate in the, in the first coming nor the second coming of Christ. Why did Israel need such detailed prophecy? And I believe we can see from parallels in our own day how important it would be for us to understand that God has all of human history in His perfect grip and is unfolding it according to his perfect plan, and it is beholden to us to trust him. That dark days are coming, and God's people with the foreknowledge of such things can trust him rather than freaking out. This was important for Israel in Daniel's day after the exile. This would be important for us in our day, knowing that there would be wars and rumors of wars, and these things would yet be birth pangs. We asked, what would the people of God do when liberties are strangled? When obedience to God's word is not tolerated by the government? When a comfortable way of life is evaporated? When supply chain disruption and financial unpredictability ruin everyone's plans? When tyrants overturn governments and overrun nations and upend the stability of life for whole masses of people? What will it be like for the people of God when the world around them is perplexed, displaced, deceived, enslaved by various lusts? Or the people of Israel in Babylonian exile would need to be prepared in heart for what would come. And so the book of Daniel is a reminder of God's sovereignty and the reality that the kingdom of Messiah would one day come and obliterate all merely human reign. But the world will be bad until he does. What is this vision all about? Daniel receives the interpretation of the ram goat vision. That is the passage we're looking at tonight. We're going to pick up in point five, but let's read from Daniel chapter eight as we begin. In verse one, we read this, in the third year of the reign of Belshazzar, the king, a vision appeared to me, Daniel, subsequent to the one which appeared to me previously. I looked in the vision, and while I was looking, I was in the citadel of Susa, which is in the province of Elam. And I looked in the vision, and I myself was beside the Ulai Canal. Again, Daniel is 70 years old here. This is two years after the vision of the Antichrist in Daniel chapter 7. And Daniel gets the vision of the ram and the goat. We looked first at the heavenly intention that God's design for giving Daniel this vision and thereby giving it to the people of Israel, this was a writing prophet, not merely a speaking prophet. This vision was to be written down and kept as a benefit uh, for God's people. And God's intention was that Daniel and the people of Israel and us reading it today would understand it. So he gave the vision and its interpretation. We saw secondly the ram, which is the Medo-Persian empire, then the goat's great horn, Alexander the Great in history, And the goat's four horns, we looked at Alexander's generals. That is the subdivision of the Greek empire into uh, Alexander the Great's four generals. That then their families ruled four sections of the Greek empire. We left off with point five in your outline. This is the vision of the goat's little horn, who is Antiochus IV or Antiochus Epiphanes. Let's read about the vision 
in verse 9. Out of one of them, that is out of one of the horns, that is out of one of the horns of the shaggy goat, so one of the subdivisions of the Greek empire, out of one of them came forth a rather small horn, which grew exceedingly, grew exceedingly great toward the south, toward the east, and toward the beautiful land. It grew up to the host of heaven and caused some of the host and some of the stars to fall to the earth, and it trampled them down. It even magnified itself to be equal with the commander of the host, and it removed the regular sacrifice from him, and the place of his sanctuary was thrown down. And on account of transgression, the host will be given over to the horn, along with the regular sacrifice, and it will fling truth to the ground and perform its will and prosper. Then I heard a holy one speaking, and another holy one said to that particular one who was speaking, How long will the vision about the regular sacrifice apply, while the transgression causes horror, so as to allow both the holy place and the host to be trampled? He said to me, For 2,300 evenings and mornings, then the holy place will be properly restored. This is the vision of the goat's little horn. We get the interpretation of that vision beginning in verse 23. Follow along with me as I read. In the latter period of their rule, that is the latter period of the horns of the shaggy goat and towards the end of the Grecian Empire, when the transgressors have run their course, a king will arise insolent and skilled in intrigue. His power will be mighty, but not by his own power. And he will destroy to an extraordinary degree. And he will prosper and he will perform his will. He will destroy mighty men and the holy people. And through his shrewdness, he will cause deceit to succeed by his influence. And he will magnify himself in his heart. And he will destroy many while they are at ease. He will even oppose the prince of princes. But he will be broken without human agency. The vision of the evenings and the mornings, which has been told, is true. But keep the vision secret for it pertains to many days in the future. Then I, Daniel, was exhausted and sick for days. Then I got up again and carried on the king's business. But I was astounded at the vision, and there was none to explain it. We're going to look both at the vision and at the explanation of the vision, combining the details of these things to get the fuller picture of the reign of Antiochus Epiphanes. This division of the Greek Empire would sprout the leader who would start small but grow great. This little horn who grows exceedingly gets most of the attention in this chapter. And again, his rule represents what would be the darkest period of Israel's history up to this point. Furthermore, his rule foreshadows the worst period that human history will ever experience. And the darkest time that Israel will ever experience. That will be the rule of Antichrist during the last period of sinful mankind's rule on the earth. Look down at verse 9. We discover that this small horn was part of one of the four. Out of one of them came forth a rather small horn, which grew exceedingly great toward the south, toward the east, and toward the beautiful, or the beautiful land. This Antiochus IV, the eighth ruler of the Seleucid dynasty, one of those four divisions of the Greek Empire, the one that ruled Syria and Mesopotamia, the land between the waters, uh, Babylon area, and then Syria, the the nation which butted up against uh, Israel and Palestine. You may remember, as we talked about last week, that Antiochus III was beaten by the Romans in 190 BC at the Battle of Magnesia. He died in 187. This began the decline of the Greek Empire. Particularly, it began the decline of the Seleucid dynasty. We'll learn um, more about the Seleucids in a moment. They were humiliated in defeat, and they were forced to pay heavy tribute to the Romans from then on. Antiochus III's son uh, was Seleucus IV. He would have been rightful heir to the throne. He became the king, but his brother... Antiochus IV, the subject of Daniel 8, was held hostage in Rome for 12 years. There he learned by exposure something of Roman military might and practice. 
Seleucus traded his own firstborn son for his brother to free Antiochus IV from Rome. Seleucus was murdered in 175 BC, and instead of his son becoming heir to the empire, Antiochus IV seized it by murder and by intrigue, by scheming. He took then the name Antiochus Epiphanes, the manifest one, or even God manifest. The Jews renamed him Epimenes instead of Epiphanes, which meant madman. And he ruled from 175 to 163 BC. A relatively short reign, but one filled with violence and persecution toward God's people. He grew great, the verse says, towards the south, that is, towards Egypt. He kept having designs on Egypt, wanted to conquer Egypt. The Ptolemies, the other branch of the Greek empire, former Greek empire, were there, and he wanted their spot. He grew great towards the east, verse 9 tells us, that is, towards Persia and Parthia and Armenia. And then it says he grew great towards the beautiful or the beautiful land, that is, towards Jerusalem. Why is it called the beautiful land? Because it was geographically, topographically, magnificently different than everything else surrounding it? No. But because it was God's place of special affection, uh, the place that was beloved of the Lord. It was His Zion. It was the location that would be the spot of His particular covenant blessings for His covenant people. It was the territorial mark of his favor. And think about this in Daniel's life. This would also be the place of his own longing. You remember that in obedience to Mosaic law, he prayed toward Jerusalem from Babylonian exile. His longing was for the place that he was taken from as a young teen. He's now 70 years old, longing for Jerusalem. This term of endearment would have special place in his heart. Notice verse 10. It grew up, that is the horn, grew up to the host of heaven and caused some of the host and some of the stars to fall to the earth and it trampled them down. Okay, this is clearly a metaphor. He's not talking about tearing down celestial bodies, comets and stars and planets. But a question arises here in verse 10. What is the metaphor referring to? The word for host is simply the Hebrew word for army. Uh, this army of stars are to be thrown to the ground. Uh, by the way, I think the, the interpretation here is thrown to the ground, not thrown to the earth. Um, the, the word can be used both for the, the terrestrial planet we're on, but also the land or the dirt or the ground. And I think the ground is what's meant here. Often this word for host is used of angelic armies, 1 Kings 22 would be an example, or perhaps even of the stars and planets of space, Deuteronomy 4.19 might be an allusion to those things. But I believe here it's a reference to people. It is often used of people. Here I believe the host is a gathering of people, specifically the people that belong to heaven. Heaven's army here I believe refers to God's people or the saints. One indication of that here in this chapter comes in verse 24, when we get the interpretation of the vision, he will destroy mighty men and the holy people, and they will be trampled there. I believe that helps us understand that what's in view here is not angels nor planets, but God's people. By the way, that idea that, that stars are used to refer to God's human people, his saints, is not foreign to the book of Daniel. Daniel 12.3 says this, Those who have insight will shine brightly like the brightness of the expanse of heaven, and those who lead the many to righteousness like the stars forever and ever. I believe Daniel here is having a, getting a vision of this Antiochus Epiphanes throwing down God's saints. And the verse says here, he threw them to the ground and trampled them. And the trampling of the saints here indicates the pernicious and difficult persecution that the Jews faced in the second century. In 170 BC, Antiochus Epiphanes murdered the high priest Onias III. He was a legitimate priest in the Levitical line, in the line of Aaron. Uh, he, they were following Torah and following the prescriptions for who could be priests. And when Onias III was murdered, Antiochus Epiphanes saw that every successive priest 
involved in temple worship in Jerusalem was handpicked by the Greeks, handpicked by the government. And often the forces that overran God's people selected priests who were not in the Levitical line, not in the Aaronic line. They were not legitimate priests. They would have been illegal according to God's law. In 169 BC, Antiochus ransacked the temple and took all of its valuables. And there began a persecution that was a concerted effort against the Jewish people. He sent his his chief tax official to burn down the city, destroy its inhabitants, level its walls, take all its valuables. And in that one campaign, 80,000 men, women, children, and infants were murdered by the soldiers of Antiochus. Women and children were taken as slaves. The city walls were torn down and a fort garrison was set up within the city walls. Antiochus himself entered the holy place, entered the temple itself. Antiochus then instigated new laws designed to eliminate the worship of Yahweh altogether. How could he eradicate Judaism? Judaism to him seemed to be the focal point and the beginning, the foundation of political rebellion. He wanted to stamp out political rebellion. He wanted everybody to be unified under his rule. So he had to get rid of this terrible religion that promoted loyalties beyond him. So he made it illegal to have any kind of religious observances. No sacrifices, no Sabbath observance. You could not circumcise your sons. All the holy books were to be torn up and burned. And violations of any of these things were punishable by death. Simultaneously, he instituted a new national religion. It was the worship of Zeus or Jupiter. He set up temples to Jupiter at Jerusalem and at Gerizim. That is the mountain where the Samaritans worshipped apart from Jerusalem. Everyone was required to participate in the worship of the Greek gods and in the worship of Zeus, whom Antiochus Epiphanes thought he was the earthly representation of. Greek soldiers and their lovers performed immoral acts in the temple at Jerusalem. Drunken orgies were the... Uh, act of worship required by everybody to participate in. And in 167 BC, in December, Antiochus set up an altar to Zeus in the temple, and he slaughtered pigs there on the altar. Altars that were then set up for this new religion in every town in Israel, and worship was compulsory. This was the trampling of God's people. Look at verse 11. The horn even magnified itself to be equal with the commander of the host, removed the regular sacrifice from him, and the place of his sanctuary was thrown down. He sought to be equal to the commander of the host. Antiochus Epiphanes did not set his sights on being equal to some minor, petty political rebellion, some human leader leading a charge against the tyranny against the state. When it says he sought to make himself equal to the commander of the host, he's talking about that supernatural being who commands God's people. Your English Bibles have this title capitalized. In verse 25, in the interpretation of this vision, he is called there the prince of princes. This is most likely a reference to God. I believe this would be a reference to to the second person of the Trinity, the pre-incarnate Christ. This one uh, appears to be a man and yet is no mere man. The uh, Seeking to be equal with just a mere man would not be so monstrous, but this one is called the commander of God's precious saints. And notice in verse 11, the regular sacrifice is removed from him, capitalized him, a reference to this one, this commander. That is, God's worship is removed from God, and the place of His, that is, God's sanctuary, is thrown down. The regular sacrifice here in verse 11 refers to the daily morning and evening sacrifices made in the temple as a continual burnt offering. Turn in your Bibles, if you will, to Exodus chapter 29. In Exodus 29, we get the prescription for the sacrifices that are prohibited here in Daniel 8. Beginning in verse 38. 
Now this is what you shall offer on the altar. Two one-year-old lambs each day continuously. The one lamb you shall offer in the morning and the other lamb you shall offer at twilight. There shall be one-tenth of an ephah of fine flour mixed with one-fourth of a hen of beaten oil, one-fourth of a hen of wine for a drink offering with one lamb. The other lamb you shall offer at twilight shall offer it with the same grain offering and the same drink offerings as in the morning for a soothing aroma, an offering by fire to Yahweh. It shall be a continual burnt offering throughout your generations at the doorway of the tent of meeting before Yahweh where I will meet with you to speak with you there. I will meet there with the sons of Israel, and it shall be consecrated by my glory. I will consecrate the tent of meeting in the altar. I will consecrate Aaron and his sons to minister as priests to me. I will dwell among the sons of Israel, and I will be their God. They will know that I am Yahweh their God who brought them out of the land of Egypt, that I might dwell among them. I am Yahweh their God. This morning and evening sacrifice, a lamb offered in the morning and in the evening, and the other sacrificial items with them, were to be a perpetual reminder that an innocent substitute slaughtered in the place of God's sinful people provided a way where God could be with them. This is a remarkable picture that the Jews would live with every single day, designed by God as a perpetual reminder of their sinfulness, His holiness, and His willing desire to be with them, to allow His name to be on their lips, to allow these sinful people to call on Him, to be known by them and for them to be known by Him. A remarkable provision of God's grace. And here this regular sacrifice of God is taken away by Antiochus Epiphanes. The place of his sanctuary, verse 11 of Daniel 8. Literally the fixed place of his sanctuary is made low. That is desecrated. Brought to ruin. Antiochus wanted to stamp out the political rebellion that he thought was caused by the Jewish religion. And he wanted to make himself great by being seen as the incarnation of deity. He could kill two birds with one stone. Be worshipped in the most sacred place of the Jews. And stamp out their religion. Look at verse 12. And on account of transgression, the host will be given over to the horn along with the regular sacrifice, and it will fling truth to the ground and perform its will and prosper. Notice the little phrase there, will be given over. Who does the giving over here? Do you remember the significance of this verb to give in the book of Daniel? In the opening pages, Daniel chapter 1, we we saw this as Daniel set the foundation for us for understanding the theology that would permeate the entirety of the book. Daniel 1-2, the Lord gave Jehoiakim, king of Judah, into the hand of Nebuchadnezzar. Chapter 1, verse 9, God gave Daniel favor and compassion in the sight of the commanders and the officials. Daniel 1, 17, God gave them knowledge and intelligence. It was God who gave his people over into exile at the hand of a wicked king. And it was God who gave to his people supernatural abilities while they were there. It was God who gave them favor while they were under, under that king. And all of this was designed to show the truth that heaven rules. That is the theme of Daniel. We see that in Daniel 4.26. It was commanded to leave the stump with its roots of the tree. Your kingdom will be assured to you after you recognize that it is heaven that rules. Nebuchadnezzar himself would be brought to the stark realization that even though he was king over a vast empire, even though he did all these things... He built things up and he stood on the roof of his palace and he said, I made all this. He would be brought to humility to understand that it is heaven that rules. God is sovereign. Proverbs 20 verse 24 says, A man's steps are ordained by Yahweh. How then can a man understand his own way? That's a remarkable statement. 
Because when you take a step, you think, I'm the one doing this. My brain is telling my foot to pick itself up and move to the next spot. And we discover that behind every human action, God is meticulously sovereign over all things. So even a man could not understand fully his own way. A man plans his steps, but the Lord directs his path. That is true of individuals. It's true of empires. And so the giving over here, I think we are to understand God is the subject. God is the one giving the saints and the regular sacrifice over to Antiochus Epiphanes who would defile it. That leads me to believe here that on account of transgression, whose transgression? It's unstated. We might think at first glance that he's talking about the transgression of this little horn who made himself great. That certainly is a bad transgression. But it is on account of transgression that the host will be given over to the horn. I don't think it makes sense grammatically to understand on the basis of the horn's transgression, the host will be given over. I think it is the transgression of the army, which is God's saints on the earth, God's people, the the nation of Israel. Their transgression is the reason God is giving them over to the persecuting designs of the little horn. What was going on in Israel at the time? Well, corruption in the leadership, the Greekification of the people. We talked about this some last week. There were some at this time in Israel who were faithful to Torah, who were seeking to live by God's word, but much of the culture had become Hellenized, that is, Greekified. Many had bought into the philosophy and the culture of the Greek world. It included such audacious architecture as a gymnasium right there in Judea. A gymnasium was a place for unclothed sporting events. And prominent Jews were involved not only in the athletics of it, but also in the spectating of it. This was severe compromise. There were those who were concerned about political liberties who just wanted personal liberty and political national sovereignty without caring for the glory of God and obedience to his word. And then, of course, there were the sellouts who were in league with the Seleucid rulers for political position, lining their own pockets. And there were people all over the spectrum. You have to think that the Israel, the the people of Israel had not learned the lessons of the exile. They had bought into Greek culture in significantly tragic ways. And many of the Jews under Antiochus' rule just went along with the worship of the Greek deities and even the worship that Antiochus Epiphanes demanded for himself just to survive. And the political situation revealed the compromise that was already in the hearts of the people of Judea. This... Not long after the people have returned from exile. About 400 years. And they seem not to have learned the lesson. The transgression spoken of here in verse 12 seems to me the transgression of the Jews who once again, after all the idolatries that sent them into exile, were again compromising with the world around them, forsaking the one true God who rescued them, who had rescued them time and time again. And so God would use the reign of Antiochus Epiphanes and the persecution that came with it, including his desecration of the temple in 167, to discipline his people. It, of course, is not the first time that God has used wicked, evil kings to do this thing, the Assyrians and the Babylonians before, Antiochus in the 2nd century BC, and the greater tribulation still to come in the future, with the greater Antiochus still of the future, to bring about God's purposes in his nation, to purify. It says in verse 12 that the little horn threw truth to the ground. He, he flung truth to the ground. It was true in Antiochus' reign that he burned every copy of God's word he could get a hold of. He executed every individual found with a copy of God's word. He also executed anyone who was found obeying its directives, even if he or she did not possess a physical scroll. He was opposed to truth, opposed to the truth of God, did everything he could to remove it from his presence. And look at verse 13. 
Then I heard a holy one speaking, and another holy one said to that particular one who was speaking, How long? How long will the vision about the regular sacrifice apply, while the transgression causes horror, so as to allow both the holy place and the host to be trampled? I believe this conversation, this interchange is happening in heaven between angelic beings. And they are saying, how long? How long? And this echoes the heart of many in the scriptures. The psalmists who cry out, how long, O Lord? Even the great tribulation martyrs, absent from the body, beheaded for their testimony of Jesus, who will be under the throne of God, present with the Lord, and crying out, How long, O Lord, until our blood is avenged? There is a waiting of God's people for the vindication of God's glory, the vindication of His name, and the bringing in of truth after it has been flung to the ground. How long will this particular desecration take place? And the answer comes in verse 14. He said to me, For 2300 evenings and mornings, then the holy place will be properly restored. There is in Daniel, and there is apparently in these angelic beings, a recognition of the importance of the sacrificial system for Israel in this time. If the only way for God to get close to and dwell amongst His people is the system of temple sacrifice, then how critical is that sacrifice? That it be done right, that it be done consistently. This was important for the well-being of God's people, for the presence of God among them. And the answer is 2,300 evenings and mornings. Uh, There is some debate among scholars, does 2,300 evenings and mornings mean 2,300 total, 1,150 evenings and and 1,150 mornings? That would be 1,150 24-hour periods. That would be a period of three years and two months. Some have tried to make it that way to get close to the three and a half years detailed in other portions of the book of Daniel. And of course, in the book of Revelation, the, the, the period delineated as the great tribulation, that period when the Antichrist will reign visibly on the earth and the abomination of desolations will take place where he will set himself up to be worshiped. And the reason that some scholars do that is they want to see the little horn of Daniel 7 that we looked at a few weeks ago, the Antichrist, equal to the little horn of Daniel 8 in Antiochus Epiphanes, and having seen all of those still yet future things already accomplished. And we're going to see there are significant differences between the two. The little horn of Daniel 7 is not the same as the little horn of Daniel 8. They come from two different empires. They, come from, uh, they have different characteristics. They have different things. And according even to this verse, their reigns are of a different time frame. And three years and two months isn't close enough to three years and six months to fit Daniel's prophecies. Uh, we actually believe the details of the timings of those things And close isn't good enough. It also fails grammatically because never in Scripture do you have a 24-hour period delineated by evenings and mornings in this way. If you go back to Genesis chapter 1, you have there was evening and there was morning one day. The evening and morning together convey a 24-hour period. Um, You don't have the the splitting them up in a way that would make uh, halftime out of this. 2,300 days of 24-hour periods uh, would be six years and four months. And it allows the little horn of Daniel 7 to be distinguished from Antiochus Epiphanes here in Daniel chapter 8. What does that mean that the time frame is delineated so specifically here? Well, it means it's going to be a long period of time. Nearly six and a half years would be a, a severe persecution a long, terrible period to endure. But it also means that it would be a limited time. Limited particularly by God's sovereign hand, according to the scope that He has set out. In other words, the political machinations of the enemies of God's people are not the determiner of how long hard things happen. God's always the determiner of those things. His people will not endure more than He intends. 
I believe the 2300 days are intended here, or six years and four months. In 170 BC, the murder of that legitimate priest, Onias III, led to the installation of government-approved priests, again, often not on the Levitical line, a violation of Mosaic law. That itself would be a desecration of the temple and its sacrifices. If a priest not in the Levitical line is offering sacrifices, that would be a violation of God's law and would be a profaning of the temple complex, a profaning of the uh, holy of holies, a profaning of the sacrificial system. In 170 BC, Onias was murdered. And it wasn't until 164 BC that you have the re-consecration of the temple by Judas Maccabeus, the hammer, uh, the one who led the political uprising uh, against Antiochus and who cleaned out the temple, dismantled the altar to Zeus, took out all the furniture and remade it and re-celebrated the, the cleansing of the temple and its purification in an eight-day festival of lights that is celebrated today by the Jews as Hanukkah. Let's pick up a few more details from the interpretation of this vision, beginning in verse 23. In the latter period of their rule, when the transgressors have run their course, a king will arise, insolent and skilled in intrigue. The latter part of their rule refers to the end of the shaggy goat, that is the end of the Grecian Empire, the end of those, uh, the, the latter part of those four subdivisions, those four horns. And Daniel 8.23 says, when the transgressors have run their course. Who are those transgressors? Those again are the Jews who have forsaken Yahweh. Interestingly, First and Second Maccabees, those intertestamental human books, they're not scriptural books, they're the Apocrypha, but they use the term the transgressors to refer not to the outside pagan world of sinners, but to the Jews who had compromised with the pagan world around them. It's interesting that the literature current to the second century BC actually picks up on Daniel's language here and calls the Jews who had compromised the transgressors. And Daniel says, when the transgressors have run their course, a king will arise. That's Antiochus Epiphanes that we've been talking about. He will be insolent. That's the New American Standard translation. Literally, strong of face, strong faced, that is harsh, merciless, lacking common traits common to humanity, the, the kind of tyrant who would order the butchering of a woman's eight children before her eyes for the crime of not worshiping Antiochus. Verse 23 says he will be skilled in intrigue, literally in the Hebrew, discerning enigmas or, or unfolding riddles. One who understood, uh, knew how to untangle difficult things. That is, he was a, a master of intrigue, maybe a talented schemer. And such a description certainly fit Antiochus' reign of terror. It's how he came into office, and it's how he ruled every day. Look at verse 24. His power will be mighty, but not by his own power. And he will destroy to an extraordinary degree. If he will be mighty, but his power will not be his own, wh whose power is being referred to? No other political entity is indicated here. No other political entity is indicated by history's record of Antiochus Epiphanes. What power is the vision speaking of? Uh, is this God's power? I don't think that's what's being indicated here. God is referenced in other ways by some of the divine passives and the giving over. But this power seems to be something else. I believe that Antiochus Epiphanes was energized by Satan. If he is a foreshadow of Antichrist to come... Uh, that would lend credence to this view. Antichrist, who is yet to come, who will do many of the same types of things, will himself be energized by Satan. Listen to 2 Thessalonians 2.9. The one whose coming is in, in accord with the activity of Satan, with all power and signs and false wonders. Revelation 13.2. The beast which I saw was like a leopard, his feet were like those of a bear, and his mouth like the mouth of a lion. And the dragon, that is Satan, gave him his power and his throne and his great authority. We certainly have the idea in Scripture that satanic power would energize a world leader 
who would organize his empire against God's people and persecute them mercilessly. That will be true one day. That may be what this vision indicates here by saying power, but not of his own. And verse 24 tells us he will destroy to a great degree his demolition of the city of Jerusalem with its walls and its buildings and his desire to burn everything in sight. In fact, the order that he gave to his chief tax officer was to raise the city, burn all the buildings, and destroy all its inhabitants. His was a Hitler-esque, genocidal, murderous intent. And he was given success. Verse 24 says, He will accomplish what he wants. He will destroy mighty men, that is, through military conquest, through domination of all the nations under his rule, he would kill many mighty men, nobles, princes, the wealthy of the nations that he conquered. And then verse 24 says, he will destroy the holy people, that is, he will bring destruction to God's precious saints. Look at verse 25. Through his shrewdness, he will cause deceit to succeed by his influence. He sits on a throne of lies. He rules by deception. He gets what he wants by destruction of the truth. He flings truth to the ground. That is the foundation of his throne. Verse 25 tells us he will magnify himself in his heart. His coins were stamped with the phrase, God manifest. That's audacious. He says he will destroy many while they are at ease. I think the idea here is he he will deceive people by promising peace and safety and security under his rule. It would all be a ruse. In fact, many of his slaughtering rampages came without warning and caught the people in Judea unawares. Verse 25 tells us he will oppose the prince of princes. This takes us back to the vision in verse 11. He would oppose the commander of the host. That is his blasphemous opposition to God himself by elevating himself to a place of worship, by stopping the priesthood and sacrifices in the temple, and by persecuting God's people. And lastly, verse 25 says he will be broken without human agency. Literally broken in pieces by a non-existent hand. That is, he would not die in battle. He would not die at the hand of humans. And historians have written that Antiochus died of grief after his army was defeated in battle at Elimaeus in 163 BC, where he simultaneously learned that his forces in Judea had been beaten by the Maccabean uprising. He was sad and fell over and died. That is the reign of Antiochus Epiphanes. We come sixthly in Daniel chapter 8 to the heavenly directive. This is in verse 26. This is God's prescription where we hear there that the vision of the evenings and the mornings which has been told is true, but keep the vision a secret. I believe that should read, and keep the vision sealed. That is protected. The the verb here means to shut up, to keep it closed. That is to preserve it for safekeeping. I don't think that keeping it a secret is a good translation of this word. The idea here is that God's word needed to be kept safe because God's people would need it. This vision and its interpretation must not be lost. It must not be forgotten in the archives somewhere, but it must be preserved faithfully for a time, verse 26 says, many days in the future when God's people were going to need it, some 400 years after Daniel received it. Seventh, we have in this vision the prophet's response. Dismay. Read verse 27 with me. Then I, Daniel, was exhausted and sick for days. Then I got up again and carried on the king's business. But I was astounded at the vision, and there was none to explain it. Exhausted here is literally to be fallen out, to be finished, to be done for, to have come to an end. And Daniel says, I was done for and sick for days. Then I got up and went about the king's business. Daniel here is still in government, though clearly not as high up in the bureaucracy as he had been at other times. This is Belshazzar's administration, and Daniel was probably appointed by his father Nabonidus and still held some position. 
Daniel says he was astounded and he was left with none to explain the vision. Wait, it, it, aren't the verses we just read the explanation of the vision? Yes, and Daniel once more. I don't know if you've ever read prophetic literature in your Bible and thought, yeah, but, but what does it mean? We just found out what it means. God has told us everything he wants to know about what it means. And Daniel was still curious. Have you been curious? I want more details. When am I going to find out? There is a time coming, Christian, when we will find out more details. But what God has revealed is what we need by his design. What are God's designs for us in this? I think they're similar to God's designs for Israel having this explanation. Listen, imagine being in Daniel's shoes for a moment, longing for Jerusalem, longing to return from exile, knowing that the time is almost up, and anticipating a restoration of God's people to covenant faithfulness in the land of God's blessing. Would this be the time when we get back into the land and are blessed by God as an obedient people under His word, only to discover that darker days are ahead? a future that would span several successive empires, this indeed would be troubling if you were in Daniel's shoes. I mentioned a few moments ago that I believe Antiochus Epiphanes is a foreshadowing of the Antichrist. That means there are similarities and differences. Satan has his schemes and some of them are recycled. God has his plans and some of them have similarities. The Antichrist would not be a a fulfillment of Daniel 8. The Antichrist rule would be a fulfillment of Daniel 7 and of the end of Daniel 12. And yet Antiochus Epiphanes' rule gives a foreshadowing of the kinds of things Israel would experience. After Antiochus Epiphanes, it seems that the nation of Israel resorted to a, a kind of fidelity to God's law even as they missed a personal relationship with God, where they rejected idolatry and they, they, they held a stiff arm to the Gentile world, and yet they crucified Messiah. And then eventually would be scattered and sent to the four corners of the earth for an undetermined period of time. One day they will be regathered in the land and they will be persecuted once again by satanically empowered empire, world ruler, who will particularly take aim at the Jews. That's coming. What similarities are there between Antichrist and Antiochus IV? Uh, They start out as little horns. Daniel 8 for Antiochus, Revelation chapter 7 for Antichrist. They will be bent on destruction, skilled at intrigue. They will be intelligent. They will both experience a short rule. Daniel 8, 24 for Antiochus Epiphanes. Revelation 17, 12 for Antichrist. They will persecute God's people. Again, uh, Daniel 8 for Antiochus and Revelation 13 and Daniel 7 for Antichrist. They will be skilled at deception. They will both be arrogant and blasphemous and neither will be killed by human hand. Antiochus Epiphanes would die sad that he couldn't get everything that he wanted. The Antichrist won't die. He will be plucked by Jesus alive and thrown into the lake of fire where he will be tormented for a thousand years while Satan is bound up, Revelation chapter 20. And when Satan is released to deceive the nations one more time, Jesus has his final ultimate victory over Satan and those who follow him at the end of the millennial kingdom. And then there is the great white throne judgment where all those whose names are not found written in the book of life are thrown into the lake of fire where the beast and the false prophet already are. So you understand that Antichrist is not like Antiochus Epiphanes who dies in history. His death will be unique, plucked alive and thrown into that which is called the second death or the lake of fire. He doesn't get a first He skips the first and goes right to the second. There are significant similarities. And the warnings that were then realized in history for Israel in the second century BC are a prototype, a foreshadowing of of warnings that come for 
a more terrible reign under a more terrible time yet to come. And that time designed by God is similarly designed for the purification of Israel. To cut out compromise of the heart and to bring Israel as a nation unto repentance and life and the embracing of Messiah whom they rejected and killed when he came the first time. More on that later in the book of Daniel. What is the purpose of all of this in Daniel chapter 8? I'll remind you some of the things we went through last week. To prepare the exiles and subsequent generations for what was ahead. To recognize that turbulent politics were ahead of them. That there would be a restored temple worship, but no national sovereignty. They would be allowed to return to the land by the nation of Persia, and then persecuted by Greece. And then dominated by Rome. That's what's coming. They needed to know these things. They needed to have their confidence in superpowers, whether it be Egypt or Assyria or Babylon or Persia or Greece or Rome or any other nation, totally eradicated. Where was Israel's hope supposed to be? In Yahweh alone. And a reminder that there's no strategy to outsmart the prophecy. The purpose of Daniel 8 was not to give Israel some insight into the future so that they could change the future, right? This is not a DeLorean with a flux capacitor to go back and change 1985. The point of the prophecy was to remind them that God is sovereign, bad times are coming, and that they must trust Him. The warning is there to strengthen their faith, not to outsmart the prophecy. And all of this was designed to get them to look, af- look ahead, ultimately, to the kingdom of Messiah on the earth. God's word would be need it, needed, so seal it up, preserve it for God's people to benefit from. All of this is a reminder to us that God is sovereign over all things, no matter how bad the world gets from our vantage point. God is in control. And it will likely be worse sometime in the future for us than it is now. And God knows what he's doing. We don't fret. We trust him. We don't freak out. We read his word. We cling to his promises. And the bottom line for any sinner is that you need forgiveness of sin. Look, bad stuff's going to happen in the world. But far worse things Await you if you meet God face to face still in your sin. It's been rightly said that an unbeliever's best days are the most terrible things you can imagine in this life. Because to meet a holy God while still in your sin is to meet the unflinching justice of an infinitely right God. Whose only response in the presence of recalcitrant sin, unrepentant sin, is to be just and to be good by punishing that sin forever. Listen, a six and a half year reign of a bad president, of a bad ruler, of a tyrant, of a maniac, does not compare to being in the presence of a holy God unforgiven. If you are still in your sin, friend, You're breathing God's air. Turn to him. The one who is provoked by your sin is the very one who provides rescue from its consequences. He, the one who will reign on the earth, Messiah, whom Daniel's been telling us about, is the one who came the first time to suffer. To suffer as a sacrificial substitute to put an end to the morning and evening sacrifices and be the once for all sacrifice, the perfect lamb slain so as to make all who believe in him, all who trust in him declared right before God. Friend, trust in Jesus. Find yourself in him. He'll come back and make everything right. And if you are forgiven, you are on the good and right side of his story. Let's pray.
Heavenly Father, thank you for this, your word. Lord Jesus, thank you for coming to earth to bear sin. We thank you also that you are coming back to the earth to rule and to reign, to put your enemies under your feet. We long for that day. We long for the vindication of truth. We long for the vindication of your name and your glory. We long for the vindication of your people. Lord, we also recognize that the path is narrow that leads to life and few are those who find it and broad is the path that leads to destruction and many are on it. And we think about a world around us of people running towards their own destruction. We think about those who gave testimony of your grace in the waters of baptism this morning. We thank you. We thank you that you still save sinners. Would you be pleased, O oh God, to bring more to yourself, to humility and faith and repentance? And God, would you be pleased to use the saints gathered in this room? Would you be pleased to use the people who love you to tell of your love to others, that they may hear and believe and find life? Lord, make use of us in our short stay on this earth. Give us a perpetual longing for your return. In Jesus' name we pray it. Amen.